Aristotle says in different places that a well-constructed simile gives an effect of smartness. But a good metaphor is a sign of genius because it implies an intuitive perception of the similarity in dissimilarities. Since Confederation, numerous writers have sought with varying degrees of seriousness and success to achieve an effect of smartness, or lay claim to genius, by subjecting Canada and the Canadian identity to the two major tropes of comparison described by Aristotle. One of, of the most enduring results, the likening of ca Canadian society to a mosaic, appears to have emerged in the early 1920s as a counterpoint to the notion of the United States as a melting pot, and in recognition of Canada's burgeoning ethnic diversity. By the late 1930s, the metaphor had furnished the title of two books, Kate Foster's Our Canadian Mosaic of 1926 and John Murray Gibson's Canadian Mosaic, The Making of a Northern Nation of 1938. And in 1965, it was given new life in the vertical mosaic, John Porter's influential study of social class and power in Canada. That the mosaic metaphor serves so long and often as a trope for Canadian society to become a cliche testifies to the aptness, if not the brilliance or genius, of its identification of similarity in dissimilarities, a quality that has also spawned similar comparisons, such as Canada is like a tossed salad, that's Arnold Edinburgh, and Canada as a great sand pile needing cement to bind its myriad grains, that's Melly McClung. The focus of this lecture today is principally on two tropes of the pre-Confederation period that may well have helped to bind Canada together. But before I turn to them, a little bit of theoretical and historical background is in order. A succinct and useful summary of the current state of research on metaphor and by extension simile can be found in the preamble to Metaphor Creates Intimacy and Temporarily Enhances Theory of Mind by Andrea Bose and our colleague in the Department of Psychology, Albert Katz. They write, most of the explanations of why people speak metaphorically when literal language might have been used involve communicative or cognitive goals, such as providing a compact and efficient way to state a complex message, enhancing the vividness of the message, and serving to illuminate, clar clarify, or explain a concept that is not easily understood with literal language. Other cognitive roles for metaphor have also been suggested, such as being especially persuasive or in creating a stronger memory trace. All of these explanations are valuable in the present context, as is the overall thrust of Bose and Katz's own thesis that the use of metaphor plays a role in, and I quote, creating social bonds and in understanding others' intentions, a hypothesis that they base on the research that flowered from Ted Cohen's contention in Metaphor and the Cultivation of Intimacy, that there is a unique way in which the maker and the appreciator of metaphor are drawn closer together, and thus into a state of intimacy, one might say empathy, generated in part by a cognitive effort to understand a metaphor and to arrive at a theory of its user's mind, its user's beliefs and ideas. Prima facie, it would appear that metaphors and similes are equipped with affective and rhetorically efficacious qualities that would be of considerable assistance in the work of envisaging, creating, and consolidating a nation. As is partly the case with mosaic and tossed salad, many of the metaphors and similes that have been applied to Canada turn on the country's relationship with Britain and especially its distinctness from the United States. Not long after Confederation, the American Secretary of State, James Blaine, likened the country to an apple on a tree just beyond our reach that in due time will fall into our hands. And in the midst of the Second World War, Winston Churchill described Canada as the linchpin of the English-speaking world, that by virtue of its relationships with the United States and Britain, 
would, quoting him still, prevent any growth of division between the nations of Europe and the countries of the New World. A short time later, another Englishman, the expatriate poet Patrick Anderson, described Canada as America's attic, an empty room, a something possible, a chance, a dance that is not danced. And more recently, the American comedian, the late American comedian Robin Williams, joked that Canada is like a loft apartment over a really great party. <laughs> and, he, and he added in another place, like a really nice apartment over a meth lab. <laughs> Besides being notable for their shift in valence, the first denigrates Canada and the second the United States, both similes exhibit the tension between similarity or likeness and dissimilarity or unlikeness that is to a greater or lesser extent characteristic of all similes because they are assertions of similarity that assume a degree of dissimilarity. One effect of this is to initiate a research, a search for the basis of the comparison, an inductive procedure that involves emotion as well as thought. The result being, in the case of the loft apartment over a really great party, the recognition that Canada is a comparatively dull place. And, the case, and in the case of a really nice apartment over a meth lab, the recognition that Canada is perhaps excessively nice and its labor to the south is pretty nasty, drug-filled, dangerous, exploitative, Charlie Sheenish. <laughs> when aggregated, the tropes to which Canada has been subjected by the writers quoted and by many others resemble passages in the poetry of Percy Bysshe Shelley, uh, where he heaps simile upon simile upon simile in order to attempt to convey something of an essence which is indescribable. While metaphors are closely enough akin to similes to be regarded as their stronger siblings, they also differ in one important way. Rather than comparing their two elements by means of like or as, they identify one little element with the other. As in Romeo's famous, Juliet is the sun. As opposed to his, Juliet hangs upon the cheek of night like a rich jewel in an Ethiop's ear. As indicated by its derivation from the Greek meta, meaning a cross, and pharo, meaning carry, hence carry a cross, metaphor involves a transference, or in Aristotle's words once again, giving a thing a name that belongs to something else, and thus creating an admixture. To describe this procedure, George Lakoff, Mark Johnson, and other cognitive linguists use the term cross-domain mapping which is to say the application of a term or concept from one domain, the sun, to a term or concept in a target domain, Juliet. Viewed through the lens of these definitions, the transference and cross-domain mappings of the colonizing process in Canada and elsewhere was metaphorical. And the term and concept British North America, the foundational confederation metaphor. In few places, are the transferences and cross-domain mappings that produced British North America more glaringly apparent than, what is now, than in what is now Ontario. Beginning in the early 1790s, with the naming of districts, towns, and physical features of Upper Canada roughly in accordance with the map of England and Scotland laid sideways across the region, the Britishing of the province proceeded with astonishing rapidity like purple loose strife. <laughs> On the 16th of August, 1792, that the, the river that the native people had called Ascunesepi and the French had dubbed La Tranche, later simply La Tranche, became the Thames. And a few months later, the settlement at the forks that John J. Grave Simcoe envisaged as the future capital of the province became New London and in time, London. Once put in place, and that is the operative phrase, the potential of the Britishing process was released with a proliferating energy derived from a powerful mixture of immigrant nostalgia and a desire among the majority of Upper Canadian settlers and administrators 
to create a society that was recognizingly, appealingly, and loyally British. As Edward Gibbon Wakefield would put it in his enormously influential essay of 1834 entitled The Art of Colonizing, the new settlement was not to be a new society, not to be a new society, but an old society in a new place. In 1800, the act of establishing the London district named the area around the proposed capital, Middlesex County. And by the 1830s, the adjacent bank of the Thames was the site of the township of Westminster. Crossing Westminster Ridge a little on the left, wrote a visitor in 1839, we overlook the wonderfully prosperous Canadian town of London, so very recently sprung from the solitudes. By 1845, London boasted bridges dignified, in the words of another rather sarcastic visitor, with the names Blackfriars and Wellington. And in due course, London would have its Covent Garden Market, its Oxford Street, its Highbury Avenue, and so on. The transferred names can almost fill a phone book. And in fact, they do. If, as Lakoff and Johnson claim in Metaphors We Live By, understanding one thing in terms of another is the essence of metaphor, then London, Ontario is Metaphors, Canada's geographical quintessence. In Conceptual Projection, and Middle Spaces, and Subsequent Essays, Gilles Fauconnier and Mark Turner and their colleagues discuss the creation of metaphor as a process of conceptual integration or blending, whereby material from one source uh, and uh, from a, um, visited on a target combine to produce a conceptual structure that contains aspects of both while also possessing what they call an emergent structure or content of its own. During the early 19th century, Upper Canada was just such an emergent structure, produced to a considerable extent by an activity closely related to the creation of a metaphor, the mapping of a source domain, Britain, conceived as highly ordered and attractive, onto a target domain, Canada, conceived as less so, but as having the potential to be transformed both conceptually and physically into a semblance of its source to which it bore increasingly resemblance agriculturally, architecturally, and constitutionally, as well as in other less obvious ways. Patrick Sheriff's remark in 1835 that the letters of the word Thames are invariably variably pronounced softly by the inhabitants of the country around London is but one small indication of the fact that the emergent structure under construction in Upper Canada, later Canada West, was both like and unlike its source domain. It was neither Britain nor Canada, but both of them and other than them, an amalgam in a specific place and as such unique. The whole secret of social figurations, wrote Norbert Elias, of his theory of the process by which societies and civilizations emerge in the civilizing process is how, from the interweaving of countless individuals' interests, whether headed in the same direction or in divergent and even hostile directions, something comes into being that was planned and intended by none of these individuals, yet emerged nevertheless from their collective interactions. Numerous pre-Confederation works of poetry, fiction, and non-fiction pro fictional prose provide glimpses of the process of social figuration at work. Few more strikingly and influentially than the 1831 novel, Bogle Corbett, or The Emigrant, the second of two semi-autobiographical works upon the founding of settlements by John Galt, himself, of course, the founder of Guelph, which he named after the family name of the Hanoverians. Faced with assertion by a group of disgruntled immigrants that rather than establish a village, every man should work for himself on his own farm, as is the practice of this country, the eponymous protagonist of the novel evokes Aesop's fable of the bundle of sticks in order to stress the value of communal cohesiveness. 
Many of you must have heard the story of the old man and the bundle of sticks, he says. Apply it to your own case. If you separate in the wilderness, you will soon find yourselves as weak as each of the seven sticks when the bundle was loosened. In other words, uh, it would be a nightmare addressed as a daydream. But if you adhere to each other, your united strength will affect far more with less effort than your utmost separate endeavors. If you continue together, your united exertions will serve in a short time for the construction of an asylum for all, and your toil will be enlivened by society. Corbett's metaphor and speech are successful in averting mutiny, largely because he's able to convince the women of the group that if they remain in the community, it will be his duty to provide for them. But if they opt to do something, to do nothing for the common good, they will be left to their own devices. As a result, the founding of the village proceeds, beginning with the construction of a temporary house in which all the emigrants can be accommodated until proper dwellings are created for themselves. A program based on Galt's own experience in Guelph, where the settlers were initially housed in a large building known as the Priory. With their strong emphasis on common good and mutual assistance, on collective morality, Corbett's remarks to the mutinous emigrants and their wives could be classified as socialistic. If it were not, for their paternal, paternalistic emphasis on duty, which is suggestive of feudalism and evocative of the romantic feudalism of William Cobbett and Thomas Carlyle, but without the nostalgia for a religious golden age that characterizes the former's history of the Protestant Reformation and the latter's better known Protestant present. Three decades after the publication of Bogle Corbett, the novel as a whole, and Corbett's speech in particular, would provide much of the inspiration for The Emigrant, a long poem of 1861 by Galt's fellow countryman Alexander McLaughlin that sees a group of fractious Scottish emigrants become united in their work and goals under the aegis of The Fable of the Wands, and the conviction that singly they are poor and weak, but when united, unbreakable. Now, between the publication of Bogle Gorbett and The Emigrant, the bundle of sticks metaphor made its most influential appearance for Canada in 1855 in Thomas, Thomas Chandler Halliburton's Nature and Human Nature, and from there in Alexander Morris's Nova Britannia or the consolida consolidation of the British North American provinces into the Dominion of Canada. A lecture delivered in Montreal in 1858 and subsequently printed widely and circulated as a pamphlet. In Nature and Human Nature, Halliburton uses his savvy American character, Sam Slick, to present Britain with three alternatives for its remaining North American colonies. First, incorporation with England and representation in the British Parliament. Second, independence. Thirdly, annexation with the United States. Of course, Halliburton's solution, he was an extreme Tory to the dilemma, is unequivocal. Canada West, Canada East, and the Maritimes should be unified and represented in the British Parliament. Here are the bundle of sticks, concludes Stick, uh, Slick. All they need is to be well united. And the chapter is called The Bundle of Sticks. In Nova Britannia, Morris does not just quote Slick's reference to the bundle of sticks and his preceding celebration of Canada as an enormous empire rich in natural resources and peopled by such a race as no other country under heaven can produce. He uses Slick's metaphor and remarks to set the inspirational tone of a lecture, uh, of the lecture's concluding paragraph. More than this, in speech at Perth on the 1st of July, 1867, he returns to the metaphor to summarize the process leading to confederation. Statesmen saw in the British North American colonies the bundle of sticks in the old fable, and that all they wanted 
was to be well united. Singly, each was weak and feeble. The hand of a child could break it. United, the power of a strong man in his vigor would be defied. Later in the same speech, Morris returns to the metaphor yet again, this time quoting Halliburton verbatim as in the conclusion of Nova Britannia of more than a decade earlier. It's more than likely, of course, that the strong man in his vigor that could be defied by the bundle of sticks is a reference to the United States. Whether or not the metaphor captured the imagination of Morris's listeners and readers, as it so obviously did his own, cannot be known. But there can be no doubt that he and his Nova Britannia lecture and pamphlet played an important role in the achievement of Confederation. There is a little book to which I must refer, said Thomas Darcy McGee when he rose to speak on the subject of Confederation in the Legislative Assembly on the 9th of February, 1865. It is a pamphlet which met with an extraordinary degree of success entitled Nova Britannia by my honorable friend Alexander Morris who has been one of the principal agents in bringing into existence the present government, which is now carrying out the idea embodied in his book, which I hope will be replicated among the political miscellanies of the provinces when we are one people. It is possible that Sir Narcisse Fortuna Bello had in mind Morris's stirring repetition of Halliburton's metaphor when five days later in the Confederation Bates, debates, he was reminded of the fable of the bundle of sticks, which so aptly, aptly applies to our present circumstances. Separated, we are weak. United, we shall be strong. It is even possible that McLaughlin knew of Morris's and or Halliburton's metaphor when he used it as a climactic moment in the emigrant. But the surest and most telling testament to the metaphor's importance comes over 20 years after Confederation, and curiously, from the pen of an annexationist, Golden Smith, who writes, though a bundle of sticks, as Federationists said, became stronger by union, and this is, a, he's writing in 1891, in Canada and the Ca Canada question, the saying might not hold good with regard to a number of fishing rods tied together at the ends. In other words, and as he proceeds to explain, when Confederation was conceived, Canada was comparatively compact, but with the extension of the Dominion to the Pacific Rim, the country had become a long, fragile, and militarily vulnerable string of provinces. Admire and praise as he did Morris's Nova Britannia, Thomas Darcy McGee does not appear to have used the metaphor of the bundle of sticks in his own efforts to promote and celebrate confederation. Perhaps he felt that the trope was too banal and folksy, or that by the time he entered the confederation debates early in 1860, it had already become a cliche. Perhaps he wanted something with a bit more depth, uh, even deep enough for us to imagine Adele rolling in it. <laughs> in any case, when he moved from the United States to Montreal in 1857, McGee came equipped with a trope that he had already used in the American Celt and American Magazine to describe his native Ireland when seen from above and from abroad, a shell-shaped island round which roll the subjected waves like the old ocean around the shield of Achilles in the Iliad. Just as Morris and before him Halliburton had turned to metaphor at the conclusion of their arguments, so too did McGee in the visionary and stirring, stirring climax of a speech on Confederation in the Legislative Assembly on the 2nd of May, 1860. And this is in your program. Uh, so I, do you want me to read it or are you okay with it in the program? You are okay with it in the program, thank you. These words have echoed through Canadian history as the most eloquent expression of British North American nationalism ever made, observes David Wilson 
in his recent and magisterial biography of McGee. They have been reprinted in school textbooks, quoted in biographies, speeches, and anthologies, and reproduced in television and radio documentaries. During the centennial period, the incandescent trope of the Shield of Achilles furnished the title of a collection of essays edited by, edited by W. L. Morton. In 2007, it furnished the title and epigraph of a chapter in Richard Gwynne's biography of Sir John A. MacDonald. And in October 2013, it was quoted in the speech from the throne at the opening of the second session of the 41st Parliament of Canada, briefly burnishing those usually lackluster proceedings with historical and metaphorical resonance. It added a touch of glamour to an otherwise bold and unconvincing story. It has become, in the words of my colleague Jonathan Vance in the history department, part of the national ceremonial. Before examining McGee's trope and speech in some detail, the shield of Achilles itself needs to be situated in its Homeric context. Constructed for Homer's operatic hero by Hephaestus, or Vulcan, the Greek god of fire and the arts, the shield is described at length in nearly 200 lines of Book 18 of the Iliad that have occasioned an enormous amount of commentary, including the famous appendix entitled Observations on the Shield of Achilles by Alexander Pope in his translation of the Iliad, which may well have contributed to McGee's understanding of the significance of what Pope calls the rich various artifice, rich various artifice emblazed by Hephaestus within the threefold circle of the utmost verge that bounds its massy round. To Pope, Homer's intention was no less than to draw the whole world in the compass of the shield. We see first the universe in general, the heavens, the stars, the earth, the seas poured round. We next see the world in a nearer and more particular view, the cities, the labors of the country, the fruits of their labors, pastoral life. In a word, all the occupations, all the ambitions, and all the diversions of mankind. After summarizing existing commentaries on the shield, Pope provides commentaries of his own on its boss, its 12 compartments, its border, which represent the happy course of the ocean. Its border does, which represents the happy course of the ocean rolling its waves around the extremity of the whole circumference. That the parallel drawn by McGee between the shield and the Canada, and Canada uh, I'm sorry, and Canada and Ireland, uh, as surrounded by ocean, suggests that it was this aspect of uh, the figure of the uh, shield of Achilles that uh, attracted him most. Be this as it may, <clears throat> the comparison between Canada and Achaea, or Greek culture, that comes with the metaphor and its context bestows an epic glow on the country to be that remains to this day dazzling, indeed, fulsomely so. In Homer's description, as in McGee's, two rhetorical devices are in conspicuous operation. Ekphrasis, a description of a work of art or another object, and chorographia, a description of a country or a nation. Master orator and rhetorician that he was, McGee understood the power of ekphrasis and chorographia to conjure up vivid and potentially affective images in the mind's eye of a listener or a reader. To that end, he adopts a rapidly moving bird's eye perspective, taking his audience first from west to east. I see within the round of that shield the peaks of the western mountains and the crests of the eastern waves. And then on a quick tour of Canada's rivers and lakes that makes highly effective use of the emotive capability of storied and historical places. The winding Assiniboine, the fivefold lakes, the St. Lawrence, the Ottawa, the Saguenay, the St. John, and the basin of Minas, the last of which had been especially resonant, had been made especially res resonant by the publication in 1847 of Longfellow's Evangeline. But perhaps the most powerful prompt to visualization in the passage is the fourfold repetition of the initial I look of the phrase I see. 
which not only encourages the audience to participate in McGee's vision of Canada as an integrated entity, but also gives the passage forward momentum and unity, two qualities that lie at the core of the speech as a whole. Nor are repeated verbs of sight or vision the only components of the passage that reflect the re and reinforce its core qualities. Grammatically, the entire passage consists of one periodical sentence that concludes with the idea towards which the speech as a whole is directed. That is, a constitution worthy of such a country. In miniature, the movement towards the alliteration of constitution and country in this climactic statement is anticipated early in the passage by the shift in meaning of the word bound. At first, bound is used with reference to a physical boundary and constraint, the blue rim of the ocean. But later, after the heraldic image of a quartered shield has acknowledged Canada's diversity, its many communities, each disposing of its own internal affairs, it is used with reference to aspects of the nation that would ensure that its potentially dissonant components were unified, bound together by free institutions, free intercourse, and free commerce. As this law statement indicates, McGee well knew the rhetorical power of triplets consisting of parallel words and phrases, a device to which he returns a little later with, by all these flowing waters, in all the valleys they fertilize, in all the cities they visit in their course, I have seen generations of industrious, contented, and moral men, free in name and in fact. In the short term, McGee's ideas may have had little political impact, but given the brilliance of its imagery and its rhetoric, the brilliance of its metaphor, his speech could hardly fail to endure in the Canadian imaginary. For the generation born around the time of the speech, Canada was a reality within which they grew to maturity. For the remainder of the century and well beyond, however, Canada continued to face the three alternatives enumerated by Halliburton through Sam Slick and reiterated by Morris in Nova Britannia. Should the young country strengthen its ties with Britain? Should it seek greater independence from the mother country? Or as Smith argued, accept the geographical inevitable and seek union with the United States. Let that apple drop into the hand. Complicating the dilemma was a factor to which Smith's metaphor of the fishing rods refers. Canada's immense size after the addition of Manitoba in 1870, British Columbia in 1871, PEI in 1873, Alberta and Saskatchewan did not become provinces until 1905, but with the completion of the uh, Transcontinental Railway, uh, they were de facto part of Canada. With the achievement of Confederation, the tropes developed to promote it had done their work. So something new was needed for the first generation of Canadians. Apparently, the earliest writer to fuse Canada's youth and its immensity, its huge size, into a trope was the influential American man of letters, this is sad to me, William Dean Howells, who has the male protagonist of his 1871 novel, Their Wedding Journey, describe Canada as the hulking young giant beyond the St. Lawrence and the Great Lakes with the very silly attitude of an overgrown womanly boy clinging to the maternal outskirts, and though spoilt and willful, without any character of its own. Adding in the narrator's paraphrase, sever the apron springs of allegiance and try to be yourself, whatever you are. Some eight years later, in Dominion Day, 1879, the, the uh, Kingston poet, Agnes Moore Michard, depicted Canada as a young female a young female giant whose mighty limbs stretch from sea to sea and throb with conscious life, waking energy. Both of these, and uh, perhaps other personifications of Canada as a giant of enormous 
but as yet not fully realized potential, may lie in the background of Charles G. Roberts' Canada of 1886, which to judge by the number of times it was reprinted, anthologized, excerpted, and praised in the 1880s and 90s, was one of the best known and most admired Canadian poems of the post-Confederation excuse me, of the post-Confederation period. Although the threat of annexation would soon convince Roberts of the merits of imperial federation, when he wrote and first published Canada in the mid-1880s, he was fervently committed to Canadian independence from Britain. In fact, at that time, he was assembling a cohort of young poets, the Confederation Group, to work towards that goal a scheme with deep roots, of course, in the Young Ireland movement in which Thomas Darcy McGee played a prominent part. Not surprisingly then, the opening stanzas and closing lines of the poem loudly echo not only the contemptuous description of Canada as an overgrown, unmanly boy clinging to the maternal skirts by the protagonist of their wedding journey, but also the novel's apostrophe ringing apostrophe, urging the boy to sever the apron strings, and indeed its depiction of the country as male rather than female, albeit with the giant limbs of Mashar's poem. And here are a couple of stanzas of Roberts's poem. O child of nations, giant limbed, who stands among the nations now, unheeded, unadorned, unhymned, with unanointed brow, how long the ignoble sloth, how long the trust in greatness not thine own. Surely the lion's brood is strong to front the world alone. How long the indolence, or thou dare achieve thy destiny, seize thy fame, or our proud eyes behold thee bear a nation's franchise, a nation's name. Wake and behold how night is done, how on thy breast and o'er thy brow bursts the uprising sun. Between these stanzas and final lines, Robert surveys the mer mercantile strength, the rich history, and the geographical extent of Canada, with an emphasis on the heroism of both British and French Canadians, and on the ostensible desire of all Canadians, at least all Canadians of European origin, to see their country achieve the full independence from Britain, represented metaphorically by its manhood. With Confederation, the tropes inevitably changed, but the work of making Canada continued unabated. My conclusion. It would be a mistake to overestimate the part played in that work by the similes and metaphors discussed here. But there can be surely little doubt that by giving vivid, affective, and memorable expression to an abstraction, the bundle of sticks and the shield of Achilles caught the attention of Canadians and helped to open their minds and hearts to the idea of confederation. As later did Roberts's Child of Nations, Canada, to the idea of independence. If there is a lesson to be learned from all three of these political tropes, it is that in order to exist, communities and nations need to be envisaged imaginatively. That to borrow and adapt Benedict Anderson's overused term, Imagined communities are communities imagined by such people as John Galt and Alexander McLaughlin, Thomas Chandler Halliburton and Alexander Morris, Thomas Darcy McGee and Charles G. D. Roberts. But a final thought and a rhetorical question. Is Canada not still a metaphorical country, a bundle of sticks still waiting to be well united, a shield of Achilles, still in the process of being forged. Thank you very much.